at the term Native American, what it means is a natural born citizen of America. Nothing to do with being Aboriginal, nothing to do with being indigenous. Your Honor, may I call to the stand my one and only witness? Um, now, normally, this would not be something that indigenous folks in the U.S. would be able to pursue in the manner that I'm pursuing it because the first thing they would be going in in an improper status, they would be going in as Native Americans. Now, what we have to do is divorce ourselves from the emotion and the history that's tied behind these terms and really just look at what they mean from a legal perspective. And when you look at the term Native American, what it means is a natural born citizen of America. Nothing to do with being Aboriginal, nothing to do with being indigenous. Um, if you really want some information or some good uh, background on it, if you check out the uh, movie um, Gangs of New York, You'll see there that when the immigrants were coming into New York City, the Native Americans were fighting with the immigrants, the English people who had been there. They were saying that we're the real Native Americans, we're the real citizens that were born here, you all are immigrants. Same stuff that's happening today. What we, what I have gone into and what we filed in the court was as an American Aborigine. So no, I'm not a natural born citizen of America, I'm an American Aborigine of the original people of America. So it gives me a different status and standing, and really what it does is it places me in the status of being a foreign national to the U.S., not to my land, but to the U.S. government, because it's on my land and I'm a separate nation from them, but also what they call a non-resident inhabitant, because our people inhabit these lands. They've been here for forever. They did not move here. They did not immigrate here. We inhabit these lands. So going into the court as an American Aborigine, foreign national and non-resident inhabitant and tribal citizen of the Mashipag Nahagansett tribe, I now am able to pursue other lawful and legal um, avenues that I would not be able to if I was going in as a Native American. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we filed this in the proper court. Now most times when you go into federal court, you're going into United States District Courts of Rhode Island. This particular case is in Rhode Island. They transferred it. But they transferred it from the District Court of the United States. So you had to pay attention to the language there. They transferred it from the District Court of the United States to the United States District Court. District Court of the United States is what they call Article Three or Constitutional Courts. They hear constitutional issues. United States District Courts are Article Four or Administrative Courts. So taxation, you know, all of the rules and regulations that are imposed upon U.S. citizens. So most of our indigenous folks go in as Native Americans into an administrative court arguing constitutional issues and they can't get anywhere. Um, we filed this in the district court. They kicked it to the U.S. United States District Court of Rhode Island. Um, I gave them help in a few things. Um, we ended up just refiling it again. They kicked it out again. Um, then they sent me a notice because we filed a corpus form. Um, after, the, after they questioned whether I really was who I was and I sent them all of the documentation, then it was, well, you have to pay $400 for the filing. Now, Indians aren't supposed to pay for the filings. But decided, okay, let's pay the $400 filing. Pay the $400 filing on October 4th. I get a letter on the 11th telling me that my case had been dismissed because I did not pay my filing. So I have to go back the next week and show them, hey, look, I have all of my, my receipts and everything. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, they go and check, and somehow, some way, the United States District Court, a federal court, the clerk or the assistant clerk neglected to add my receipt into the system. So I, once I clarified all of that, they told me no problem, we'll send an email out, I get a personal letter from the assistant cur uh, clerk, court, court clerk apologizing for the mishap and sending me my documentation so that we can serve the state of Rhode Island, city of Providence, and city of Cranston. Now, for those who have not been as involved with the case, um, let me just read what some of the specific counts are because this is going to be public knowledge in a few anyway. Uh, the overall case, of course, is environmental racism, and that's doing things to denigrate my natural inhabitation specifically because of who I was. So we know that the state of Rhode Island detribalized the Narragansett Indian tribe specifically because they were Indians and their land claims. We know that they reclassified members of the tribe to things other than an Indian, which is an aborigine of North America or South America, to uh, classifications such as colored, black, all of these other things. Uh, my fourth great grandfather, Brister Michael, was one of the chiefs of the Narragansett Indian tribe in 1881 when they got detribalized. If you look up the report from the Commission on Indian Affairs, you'll see his name all in there. They identified him as one of the chiefs who could decide who was a member of the tribe and who wasn't. 
and I have a copy of his birth certificate, and lo and behold, he's colored. So how does the chief of a tribe go from being a chief to when he dies being colored? So this is showing all part of the processes and the things that they went through in order to remove us from our proper status as who we are and to take our power away to stop them from doing things to our land that we didn't agree with. So when we actually get into the actual case, um, So the first count is under international law, Alien Tort Claim Statute, just code in the federal common law, the plaintiff holds by right aboriginal ancestral title to and the exclusive right to occupy under trust the aforementioned lands as stated described therein. So basically the first argument is that you took my land and it's not yours, it's mine. That's the first thing. You took my land and it's mine. You've never compensated, you just took it. And this is speaking specifically for the Mashapog area. Um, and this gets starts covering a lot of the dirty secrets that Rhode Island's been holding. Um, so that's the first thing. You took my land and it's mine, and you took it. Count two is a constitutional violation of 42 U.S.C. Statute 1983, claim against the state. And that's for an unconstitutional taking of my land without proper remedy. So that's a violation of the U.S. Constitution. You can't take something from someone and not give them remedy or compensation for it. Count three is violation of Article 1, Section 16 of the Rhode Island Constitution. Once again, you took my land and did not compensate me for it. Count four is a violation of the ISERD Convention. It states, um, the acts of defendants constitute a permanent and substantial interference with the right of the plaintiff and plaintiff's tribes to a fair procedure, right of use to aboriginal ancestral lands and territories, the right to life, food, water, health, the right to environmental protections against racial discrimination, and the right to self-determined actions to establish self-sustainability without infringement. That's count four. Count five is a violation of the Apartheid Convention, because not only did you take my land, you reclassified me, and then you forced me into a situation where I had to come work for institutions, businesses that you set up. So initially it was being forced onto a reservation, being forced into indentured servitude. Then once we, you drained everything out of us from that, you forced us to sell off whatever lands that you had given us, which is crazy, you're giving us our own lands, you raised the taxes on them and took them from us, then a lot of us had to move to other areas to find employment to take care of our livelihoods. That was not how our people lived. We hunted, we fished, we shared with each other. So it's a form of apartheid here in the U.S. done upon indigenous folks by destroying whatever they had and forcing them to be a part of your system at their detriment. Um, and then, last count after that one is count six just environmental racism once again you denigrated my habitat specifically because I was Indian you came in the magic pod you allowed companies to come in and dump into the lake there um, if you go I mean to the pond if you go over to the pond they have uh, things up right now that say don't walk over here and if you do take off your shoes and clean them before you get home because the land's so toxic so my dignitary chief is there one of my council chiefs is here, um, a couple of the members are here. Our real question to the state is, if we decided today to give up all of this colonial structure that's been placed upon us, how would we go back and live our natural lives in our natural habitats? We can't. You ruin that for us, and there's no going back. So we need to be fairly compensated for that. Now, um, our ultimate goal and our hope with the state is that they'll do the right thing and settle with us. We reached out to them, what, a year and a half ago? A year and a half ago, expressing to them who we were, what we were requiring, but mainly that this was not our interest of being adversarial with the state. We didn't want to come and make enemies. This isn't about getting back at you for what you did to our people. It's about the fact that you did something wrong and you need to make amends for it because we can't move forward collectively all of the communities that are here unless we address what the wrongs in the past were. Um, me, I've matured past the point of being angry about this sort of stuff because my anger was taking me down routes that weren't beneficial to me moving my people forward. So instead I focused that anger into being progressive and productive. So I'm going to angrily force you to do things that are positive for my people. I'm going to passionately call you out on all of your mess. I'm going to pull out all of this information about who my people are and what you did to us that I'm sure a lot of Rhode Islanders don't know about. I mean, there was a certain point where they were saying there was no more Indians in Rhode Island. And yet I'm looking around, and it's just craziness to me. 
So this gets into what, and it goes beyond Rhode Island because this is what happened in places all around the country. Right now, the Poconopics have a suit here in Rhode Island. I believe they're gonna be doing one in Mass as well. Sand Hill Band of Lenape and Cherokee Indians have one in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, in New York as well. Because this is not anything that is specific or solely Rhode Island. This is a policy that came out of Virginia and just swept the entire country because they realized that they messed up by never getting treaties with the tribes here. They got them when they went out west, so they had a legal document that said the land was theirs. But here after King Philip's War, they massacred us, they sent us to reservations, and they took the land. No contract. So right now, um, reached out to our fantastic uh, friends at FANG. Um, as part of the uh, process, I, or neither I or anyone who's party to this claim can serve the state of Rhode Island, city of Providence, the city of Cranston. But of course, FANG isn't part of the Mashapog Niagansett tribe, is it? So they can absolutely serve this. So I have here the service papers. What I'm going to do is right here in the top one, because we're serving the state of Rhode Island, I'm going to write state of Rhode Island. Whoever is going to serve the document is to bring this in. You have to keep these two, but you have to find out who you served and write their name in there. It says, I personally served the summons on the individual at the place on this date. And you're going to date it and sign it and give your address. What you are going to leave them is a notarized copy of the actual suit so that they can peruse it and see what they have 21 days to respond to. Um, and like I said, it is our hope that they do the right thing and figure out a way to settle with us. But we know that this is Rhode Island, so we might be very well seeing a court case in the very near future, um, which we don't have an issue with either. So whichever route they want to go on is fine. And we do want to say this as well. There are entities and individuals in the state right now who understand and get what it is that we're doing and have been working with us to give us the resources and supports that we need. We just left the training with the City of Providence's Office of Healthy Communities because we've been working with them for the past four or five months to be able to obtain health care and human services for our tribal members like the policy state. So you can't even say that it's the entire state of Rhode Island. There just seem to be certain individuals in certain positions of power who don't understand when the game is up. So that's what this suit is for. Um, as I mentioned, we filed back in January 7th. We're just getting all of the, which is just crazy, isn't it? You file a suit in January 7th and you're just getting a chance to serve it now. But whatever the case may be, um, we just want to say to everyone out there, um, you know, the fight continues. Um, we know that for many of us, there was a, a definite blow to our uh, perhaps self-esteem and uh, feeling of uh, what the future is going to look like based upon how the election results came in last night. Um, but once again, that's just America showing what America has been for a very long time. They're doing exactly what they said they wanted to do, going back to the time when they thought America was great. And look who they elected to be the leader of that. So from an indigenous standpoint, this ain't nothing new to us. This is what we've been going through. Um, we're sad to see that now the rest of our neighbors here in these lands are starting to see the same thing that we've seen since this country started. Um, but what better time to be coming together to address our collective issues now and to support you know, the real issues that we're facing now than right now, especially given what happened yesterday. So I just think it's fantastic you had that election yesterday and today we're doing this. Um, so I'm just going to write State of Rhode Island in the top here. Um, and I'm not sure who the lucky individual is that's going to be... Oh, very, would mm -hmm. you care to introduce? <laughs> uh, sure. My name is Morgan Victor. I am part of the FANG Collective, um, an environmental justice group. And based out of, we're now located in, North pa in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, actually. And we're here to be in solidarity with indigenous folks in the fight that, like Ray clearly and very articulately stated, um, has been going on for years, hundreds of years. And so I am more than honored to be able to do this. Um, I am originally from New Bedford, Massachusetts. I identify as Wampanoag, part Wampanoag Indian. And so, yeah, I'm happy to be here and do this for you all. You can't fake this long, partner.